It is Kill You With Truth, Chuckle at Pain with uh, <laughs> the Chuckleheads themselves. Nate Jackson with me. Hopefully, Chad joining us soon. Got to make sure Chad gets the proper amount of rest, and uh, and we'll go um, one way or the other. My friends, if you like and subscribe, you help out this channel, and uh, we would always appreciate that. Nate, we wake up this morning. We'll get to George Payton and Sean Payton in a second. But in his latest mock draft, Mel Kuyper, I know, with breathless anxiety, you await Mel Kuyper's latest mock draft. And it is funny. I saw on ESPN, they were asking about, well, you got this guy instead of that guy. What changed? Like, <laughs> Nothing really changed. I just can't do the same draft every time. I got to make some sort of difference. But he has um, J.J. McCarthy going to the Broncos. Good morning, Chad Brown. Good morning. So, uh, Nate, your hair is so fucked up right now, bro. It's, it's, <laughs> there's, there's a hair out of place. Look at that hair. Oh my god, you should be embarrassed. Pull that out. Snip well, it Chad, it's my Chad, alpha. Needs, Chad looks yeah. good, and he he was a little bit late, Nate, because he had to, of course, brush his teeth for a podcast. <laughs> I do uh, to me. JJ McCarthy, what do you think for Mel Kiper uh, with the old mock draft there, Nate Rooney? Sure, man. Um, yeah, sounds good, right? Uh, nobody knows. Flip a coin. How do you feel this morning? I saw Mel Kuyper once at a buffet in Vegas with his family. Uh, I was out there uh, having some fun, um, and he was there with his family. My book had just came out, and I was there with my buddy, and he's like, you should give Mel Kuyper one of your books. I'm like, no, nah, man, no. Uh, that was my Mel Kuyper story. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't give him a book. He was eating. He was eating breakfast with his brunch with his family. Um, I wonder what Mel Kiper does for the other half of the year. You know, is he going to be able to live twice as long because he only emerges for six months out, out of the year? That's going to be interesting. Mel Kiper has made a, a fortune it's doing crazy. what he's doing here. It's great. And you know, you wonder how accurate it is. Like what he's done. Has anybody ever gone back and crunched the numbers and seen how? he's actually done if he's been right if he's been wrong the guys he's bet is the farm on have they panned out like does anyone know if mel kuyper knows what the fuck he's talking about at all nobody gives a shit and here's why because sometimes in sports it's the anticipation of moment not the actual moment so nobody really cares and to mel's credit he got in on something the draft before anybody even thought about it I went to college with a guy named Matt Berry. Matthew Berry. Yeah. The, the Matthew Berry. Yeah. You could have knocked me over with a feather if you told me Matthew Berry was going to be into sports. He, we worked at the same college radio station. He was wow. a creative guy. He was a writer. He wanted to be a Hollywood writer. Yeah. Um, and he wasn't really much, much of a disc jockey or a personality. When I saw he became the prominent voice in fantasy football, I was absolutely stunned. But here's what happened. He was writing in Hollywood. He was, wasn't really going that far. And he figured out this fantasy football thing to his credit. And he's made his entire career on fantasy football. Nobody ever goes back and checks Matthew Berry's math on fantasy football shit because nobody cares. But sometimes that one person just thinks of something before everybody else. And that's just how you stay there. There's nothing special about Mel Kuyper, Chad, compared to 10,000 other draft experts, except for the fact he got in the door first. And so for my uh, boy, Matthew Berry with fantasy football, and you know what? Good for them. Absolutely good for them to be able to seize the moment, take advantage of it. And for Mel to get in with a platform like ESPN when the draft was just beginning to build some momentum from a national story year in and year out. Yeah, he's created an entire career around uh, shouting about at us about some fourth round pick that the Indianapolis Colts missed out on. So it's a beautiful thing for him. And then it's created a, an entire draft industry, this Mel Kuyper thing. Other people wanted to be like Mel, so now there's all kinds of other junior Mel's around the country doing it on podcasts, doing it on radio shows, doing it on TV shows, writing about it. Uh, yeah, it's actually helped push and popularize the NFL offseason in a way that just simply wasn't there before. But to Nate's point, there's no accountability in sports media, man. It's all about talking about what's going to happen. Once something's happened, that's old news. We don't need to hold you accountable for that. What's the next thing you're going to tell me that's possibly going to happen? You know, even though mocks don't get them 100% right, 
more so than not, if you aggregate a lot of common thinking, you get pretty close, guys. You do. I mean, oh, wait, you, no, wait, are you telling me no, that if you get no. every single person's mock draft and you aggregate it, then some of them are going to be right? Well, the <laughs> names, the name, like you're going to know the top offensive linemen, the top corners, the top edge rushers. You, you really will. You'll you'll know the names at quarterback. Very, very rarely does a name just pop up and shock you. If there's a name taken in the top 12 that I have not n- heard or spoken through my lips, I'll be stunned. I mean, you can sort of go through it off the top of your head with the three quarterbacks and now J.J. McCarthy with the Broncos. And then you got Jared Burst and Alan Turner and Terry and Arnold and Joe Alt. And you just go through some of these guys. Fashnu is another dude. Like, And these are just the names that are coming up over and over and over again. So whether it's specifically right or that more or less the thinking as these are the top guys, Nate, that aggregates pretty accurately year after year. Go ahead, Chad. I just respectfully disagree. We can't even get the top five picks right. I've had a long-standing bet with all my friends. Give me the top five picks in order to the team, and you know you win the bet. I have yet to have anyone claim this prize. People can't even get the first five picks picks right much less the first 12 or 15 so yeah I, I think there can be a generic understanding of who the top prospects are but there's always going to be a team that does the mitch trubisky there's always going to be a, a, a 49ers who move heaven and earth to move up and get trey lance there's always going to be somebody who does the wild card move to make all that happen well sure but trey lance was a name we were talking about as was mitch trubisky Like, that wasn't a surprise that they were high-valued guys in their draft years. Not at all. It wasn't. If you're talking about specific team, specific player, I mean, okay. And in terms of the top four guys, listen, man, if it's anybody but Kayla Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, and Marvin Harrison Jr., right off the top, in that order, I'll be a little bit surprised. But, hey, listen, that's why I don't know about five. Five to me is, (laughs) you know, gets a little dicey there. But, listen. I'll give you a consensus on the aggregate. Knicks, Penix, and McCarthy will be gettable for the Broncos either at 12 or slightly up maybe at nine with the Bears, Nate. And then you got to make a decision based off that, right? So that's it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the Broncos might trade down, you know. they, they, they <laughs> I know you don't like to hear that. Oh but they've, they've evaluated. And I heard you guys talking about this on PhD yesterday. Hey, coming at you. Um, you know, he like they like what they have first grain first round evaluations for 12 to 16 guys or something like that. Yeah. What is the number? So if you're sitting at 12 and then, you know, they've only chosen four of the guys you like and it's it and they've picked nine players well then you, you got to think you could probably trade down and still get one of those guys right and, and so there could be some trading down happening like around pick seven eight or nine or ten when the broncos realize that we can still get the guy we want if we trade down to 21 or 22 or something like oh that. So, my god so, oh it just it could happen oh man i mean they're god. hey man you know you know george payton likes the darts he's a dart player he, he's a, he, he likes he likes to uh, take his shots there, and maybe Sean Payton will go along with that. And um, one of the things Sean Payton was talking about also that I heard you guys talking about on PhD was um, Sean Payton saying, we like the fact that w- that the rest of the teams don't know how to evaluate players, right? <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so this will give him more opportunities later in the draft to get guys that they like because, because and I don't, maybe he's not wrong here, Play teams do misevaluate players. You talk about the consensus, D Mac, about everyone knows who the top guys are gonna be. Well, maybe that's what Sean Payton's talking about. Because everyone is fucking stupid because teams get wrapped up in this everyone knows who the top prospects are thing, and they fall for it as well. And they aggregate the mock drafts and they fucking listen to Mel Kuiper Kuiper. And in the end, yes, everyone's wrong, right? And Sean Payton sees that okay and knows that. People don't know what they're doing. So Sean Payton is smarter than everybody else, Chad. That's that's the difficult part of the logic there, that somehow he has the secret sauce. Very talented football team. Talented football people make mistakes on personnel all the time because it's so difficult to evaluate a human being because that's what a football player is. You're looking at the tape 
which gives you a bit of an indication. You do the test at the combine and you do all that stuff. But in the end, it's a human being who shows up in your facility. Who's he connect to? Who's he motivated by? Does money matter to him? Does money not matter to him? There's so many question marks that you simply cannot answer in the evaluation process that I would think John Lynch has done pretty good as a general manager of the San Francisco 49ers. But clearly, the Trey Lance was a massive swing and miss. Uh, Mitch Trubisky, Howie, Howie Roseman with the Philadelphia Eagles. They have done a tremendous job and won Super Bowls out there. They swung and missed big time on that one. They drafted Mitch Trubisky before the Chiefs drafted Patrick Mahomes. So it just goes to show you may be a talented football person, but if you're Sean Payton and you think you're going to get this right all the time, well, you're sadly mistaken, my friend. Talented football people screw this up every single year. Yeah, also, Sean also, Watson too. Yes, go ahead. Dan. Sorry, like yeah. when you, you know, you're talking about quarterbacks, the swing and the misses, and how much those fuck up the franchise. The quarterback swing and miss more so than these other positions, and so you have to be very careful when you. And I know, you know, DMac, I think you have a different philosophy here. You're like, just keep swinging, man. Keep swinging. You know, find the find the best quarterback available at the pick you got and swing. But but when you don't get it, you you, you set yourself back quite a bit, and so. Um, you got to be extra sure. And so it's a good thing we got a genius like Sean Payton at the helm. Well, let's get to some of that. Here's Sean Payton. Talk about a tell. Yeah. Well, look, we better, you know, so the question was. Technical yeah. difficulties. Look, I yeah. know. I know. Yeah. Oh, uh, hopefully it'll work. Give me, give me one more shot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, we better, you know, so the question. Oh, it was, it's so impressive when it works. That it's, was working. It's, it, yeah, no, it did. Uh, it yeah, was, uh, was that the one where we talked about the meme and the shirts? Yes, yes, yes. Let me try one more time. If I can't get it, you know what uh, I'm saying. Well, look, we better, you know. So the question was, you know, finding the right solution to quarterback in uh, in in this league, which is obviously very competitive in our division. Uh, I, I think it's I think it's vital. Um, I, I, I saw this like humorous meme the other day where there was a, a Bronco fan with a shirt on and there was like eight quarterbacks. Gosh darn it. Well, you know what he's going to say. Eight well, I mean, these, the pregnant pauses there with him are just <laughs> I hard know, to, I know. Hard to is, it a, is it a meme or is it a mean? Because it's a meme, right? He said it's a mean. Well, Did he say mean? It's, yes. a, it's a mean meme. <laughs> and it's got the quarterbacks crossed out. Meanwhile, you know, it's funny. You see Bean, the uh, GM there of the uh, the Bills, and he was, like, asked about moving up for Josh Allen. He goes, well, if he doesn't work, I'll get fired. So who gives a shit? <laughs> <laughs> that's literally what he said. He literally said that. So that's how I feel. Although George Payton is so much more cautious about things, you know, because he he – he just knows that, you know, the quarterback thing is risky. You just want to get around him as much as you can. You know, I was fortunate to see, you know, a lot of these quarterbacks uh, during the fall, and then and, and that's one step of the process. And then you have the all-star games, and then you have the combine, and then you have pro days and maybe private workouts. So as much as you can get around them and see what, you know, what makes them tick. You know, Sean talked about leadership. What's the day-to-day -day like? And what do their teammates feel about them? You can evaluate the arm strength, the accuracy, the athleticism. You know, being able to process is a little more difficult, but I think the more you can get around them, the better decisions, you know, you'll make. Because he knows how risky things are. Yeah, Chad, or uh, Nate, rather. So. Oh, no, yeah. I mean, revelation number one, <clears throat> number one is that Sean Payton is doom scrolling Instagram like Denver Broncos. I mean, <laughs> well, he's pooping probably. Like, who doesn't, right? Is, is there poop on everyone's phone because of that? Um, I wonder the poop scrolls. Wow. Just gotta create some some mist in the air, but um, I watch but, my phone. Yeah, you probably do every day. Yeah, huh? I'm sure you do. Yeah, watch that's probably phone. a good idea. Yeah. yeah, they say the phone is is dirtier than even the, the toilet seat. Not mine, because I wash it. <laughs> you don't wash your toilet seat. I do that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, Sean Payton pays attention, man. He pays attention to the conversation, right? He and, and I think he actually is tickled by the conversation and by all the Mel Kuypers of the world and those who think they have it and the Cecil Lammies of the world and the mock drafts and like, Hey man, DMAC, are you doing a mock draft by the way? Where's your mock draft? Uh, I, I really should do one. Shouldn't I? I should just have the DMAC, uh, DMAC 1.0. DMAC. 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 I, I will. 
Nate, I will do the D mock 1.0. I will do my mock draft and I'll I'll give you all my goofy reasons why who's going where. A lot number of it will, a lot of it will one. be uh, I don't know this guy, but I see a right. lot of other people like him. Yeah. You got to do number one through Mr. Irrelevant. I mean, imagine the time you were taking. Uh, what? No, some people fucking do that shit. Do that. The seven round mocks. The yes. seven round mocks are sick. Yeah. They are sick beyond sick. Yes. Dane Brugler, uh, the athletic, he does a seven round mock. It's it's insane. It's it's like a Bible. It's like 300 pages of draft information. It's so much overkill. Now, to go back to George Payton, of course, George Payton has to talk cautiously. He just made possibly the worst quarterback trade of all time. Well, right. I guess maybe Deshaun Watson would beat that. And then Deshaun Watson's contract would beat Russell Wilson's contract. But the second worst quarterback contract of all time. So George Payton has to talk from a cautious standpoint. He's got no confident leg to stand on at this point. Yeah, let me play. try to play this. George Payton about the importance of the quarterback. Yeah, I mean, it's the most important position in sports. So it's, it's important. Um, you know, whether it's from within, you know, that's why this is taking a long time. It's not just going to happen overnight. Our decision is very important. But uh, if you're going to draft one, I mean, that's that's obviously very difficult. And uh, and so we're going to put a lot of time into it like we do every position. But the quarterback position is is just that much. You know, there's more mistakes, it seems like, at quarterback, especially, you know, in the first round. There it is. That's your GM. There's more mistakes. That's his mindset. There you go. It's true, it's not, though, man. It's true. It, 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 it's true, but it's also, it's. I think that's the wrong mindset to take into it. Like Bean said, I moved up because we got to do it because I'm getting fired either way. Like, that's it. The end. If I don't do it and we suck, I'm going to get fired. And if it doesn't work out, I'm going to get fired either way. That's, that's what but, the job comes with. But you're misunderstanding the way he's looking at team building. What he's trying to say is that it's smarter to to build your team around the quarterback than it is to just swing at a quarterback. That's what he's saying to you, that, that a stronger team is going to make a quarterback play better. Yeah, but Bean, is, weaker... telling, the Bean is telling you, who gives a shit? Like, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, you can't choose when you suck. We're here. This is the moment. That's why I get paid so much. I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, um, I feel so passionately about it. It's ridiculous. Have you put some thought into this? Uh, this I, have, I feel like I've spent my entire adult life talking, <laughs> thinking about this one all right, so topic. All right, all right. So you're George Payton, all right? Yes. What do you do? Tell me what you're going to do, DMAC. Well, first of all, I just go get Sean's coffee because that's the most <laughs> important thing right off the bat. Because I'm if I'm if I'm George Payton now, I'm keeping my head low and going with whatever Sean wants to do. Because I care about my job and I don't want my kids to uh, leave Valor. That's what I'm doing. Um, but if you're asking me as a new GM, what do I do if I don't have all that crap. other crap? Who do you want? Who do you want? What I do you move do up you and I assess it and I take the best quarterback I can get. The end. And I don't look back. And I fully commit to that guy. Period. And, and I, to, to, that's why dropping back to me, it really, seriously, I, I really do want to step in front of oncoming traffic when I hear about moving back to get your quarterback. I mean, I think that is fucking bullshit. I mean, either be in with this guy or not. And this half pregnant sort of attitude with the Broncos over the years has driven me fucking nuts. Can I be more clear about it? No, no, I don't think so. So what about the big swing that he took uh, with getting Russell here? I mean, was yeah, that, desperation. Was that a lesson? Like, uh, yes, yes. Total desperation, high risk, high reward. And he should have lost his job because of it. The fact that he still has his job is actually the, 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 the most amazing press conference to me is after they blew out Hackett, he, Peyton, was sitting on that stage next to Greg Penner. Couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. And I was like, wow, if you can survive that, I, I guess you're okay. But everybody was just blaming Hackett, Chad. So it was all Hackett's fault. And now it's Russ's fault. Well, whose fault is it going to be next? George Payton's fault. It has to be. At right. some point, that sword's got to land on him or he's got to land on that sword. One of the two has got to happen here. Uh, this quarterback thing, you know, it's it's impossible to give yourself a guaranteed chance for success. It is just impossible. So the Broncos find themselves – in this situation again, and we can argue ad nauseum about what the right philosophy to take is. Do you build up your team? Do you do the DMAC and, and take a swing every single year until you get the guy? Um, 
I don't think that's the right philosophy, but I, I have definitely been on pretty good teams where we were okay at quarterback, and that gets you into the playoffs. It doesn't make you a champion. So but considering there's only one team happy at the end of every season, would the Bronco fans accept a playoff-bound team that really has no shot of winning at all because the quarterback's not good enough, or they do your philosophy of taking the swing every single chance they get until they get the guy. And so it could be six or eight or 13 or 14 sucky quarterbacks in a row until you find the one that actually works for you. That's a long time for a fan base to be disappointed. And the uh, problem is yeah. with doing that is – each time, you know, this is the Glennon Trubisky doctrine, right? Each time you do get a new quarterback, you got to give him enough time to figure out if whether Absolutely. he's the guy or not. Ab- absolutely. That's part. I, I say 37 starts, which seems okay. like a lot. 37 but starts. All right. That's right. But, he's not, but he's not a golfer. Okay. He's not doing this by himself. There are so many moving parts around him that are going to affect his play and how well he plays the coaching the players around him, the offensive line, the scheme, the defense, the special teams. Yes, even the special team is going to affect the quarterback. Everything about the team and the organization, the ownership, the everything, the practice schedule, the health of everything is going to affect the way this player plays. And so maybe this guy actually has potential, but he doesn't, you know, and he's not going to get 37 games. I know you like to say 37, but he's not going to get that. Nobody's going to get that much time anymore. What do you get, 20 maybe? Um, how many did Drew Locke get? Not enough. 12, 13. I mean, yeah, I mean, not enough. Right. There was enough. There was enough to evaluate what Drew Locke is. <laughs> not for me, man. Not for me. I think I think he was a late bloomer and needed more time. And that's the bullshit about taking a quarterback in the second or third round. You're 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 going to take a less talented guy, at least by NFL consensus, and give him less opportunity. Makes no sense. Two two Makes organizations. No Two organizations have decided that Drew Locke is not an NFL starter. Yeah, Two. But, like, yeah, but you Two. can't you can't get in a time machine. The balloons. <laughs> the balloons. It did it again. It did it again. Oh, Two. Oh, what was that? Is, but but but, but my point is, you can ruin a player too. Two. Two <laughs> balloons. You can ruin a player as well. So to say, well, two organizations did it, it's like. Well, no, not really, because they did not center everything around that player. Listen, I think there's a huge flaw in the NFL. When you look at baseball, hockey, basketball, Hunter Tyson last night was playing for Grand Rapids, the gold for the Nuggets. The 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 Rockies have multiple minor league systems. Hockey has the Eagles up north, right? But in football, what do you got? No, no, no. Sit on the bench. Not only are you going to sit on the bench during the games, you ain't going to practice that much. It's a messed up system. I don't even get it. I don't know how anybody expects somebody to not play to possibly develop. So you want to talk about two organizations? That's two organizations where you weren't doing shit. So how are you supposed to develop? Seriously. So that, and and I'm telling you, give, listen, I didn't want Drew, Drew Locke drafted in the second round anyway. So why the fuck am I standing up for something? But it's just to prove my point, I became a bigger Drew Lock fan because I saw how ridiculous the expectations were because they didn't give him the right opportunity, which further proves my point. Anything beyond the first round, good fucking luck. And I am for drafting a quarterback later on. The Broncos get six picks. Two of them should be on quarterback. And, you know, if the guy in the fifth, sixth round doesn't work out, so what? We'll draft another guy like that coming up. But sure. There could be a Brock Purdy or a Tom Brady. I mean, in the world of you never fucking know, right? That's fine. But that's not the plan. That's a shit plan. That's a terrible plan. And dropping back to me is the same thing. Same exact thing. You're just not into them. So don't draft them. Period. All right, I'm tired. All right, anyways, let's get to Sean Payton shitting on Russ, huh? That'd be fun. We'll just get to that in two weeks. So I I expect... I expect that we're going to know fairly quickly. I said it's the Super Bowl, but I think more specifically, I think uh, somewhere in the neighborhood next week, we're we're going to. There's a couple factors here. You know, obviously the cap projections came out. Um, We're further down the road with the draft class. Uh, Obviously, the pro free agents. Really seriously, can I just throw it through? I think the computer feels my anger. You guys did this to me on purpose, by the way. You realize you did this to me on purpose. (laughs) Wild you up. You, you know you can get me going on this anytime you want. Anyways, uh, Sean said two weeks with Russ. He said two weeks two weeks ago. 
Right. You know, he said two weeks, uh, two months ago. Well, it's like it's like when you're in that horrible relationship and you're talking to your boys and, and they're like, when are you going to break up with her? And you're like, I'm doing it next week, man. Like, I got to wait till after the freaking we got this wedding to go to. Right. And I'm going to wait till after the wedding. Oh, but her birthday's in two weeks. So I'm going to wait till after her birthday. And then we're going to there's never a good time to break up. Right. There's never a good time. There's always the next thing that's going to just do it man. pull the bandaid off. Just call them and tell them you're not that into them anymore. Chad, we, we've known this was coming ever since Russ was benched. This is no surprise. So the fact that they're trying to string this along and I guess read the tea leaves about all these other pieces of the puzzle, you're not going to fool a team into making a, a, a foolish trade. Just make the move, make it happen, man. Um, so yeah, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. So I mean, we, everyone around the Broncos is talking about Russ in the past tense. So let's just make this happen and, and begin to move forward to a new era of Bronco football. I think the the most <laughs> the most idiotic thing that he could have done at the end of that Brandon Marshall interview <laughs> was after you know he wanted us to get be in his corner and believe in what he was saying and stuff like that. And then at the end, Brandon's like, "And now your house is on the market." He's like, "It's not on the market." I don't know what you're talking about, man. <laughs> Zillow's wrong. Like, that's not what <laughs> that just like wipes out everything you've said for the last hour. If we can, if you're not just able to admit a basic fact here, right, right. you know, that we can all see. What a strange thing to lie about. Yeah. Like, what a what an odd thing to like. Yeah, man. Like, we this we didn't make this up. Your house is for sale, dude. We we get it. What do you think? That was just somebody nah. just made that up? Nah. It's not. Nah, it's not nah, for sale. Nah, people don't know. Nah. People don't know. Nah, it's not for sale. All right. Any other big takeaways? Uh, they they did talk about a bunch of other stuff that we could actually get into as the week goes on. They talk about the future of Drew Sanders and Marvin Mims, and you know other stuff as well. It was interesting. I thought to hear how they thought they underutilized the rookie draft class last year. Okay, I mean that's on you guys, right? If you're not going to use the dudes that you believe in at some point. Um, any any other bigger takeaways that you guys had from yesterday? That kind of stuff cracks me up, the revisionist history of it all. Because there was a push to play younger guys. Marvin Mims did get an opportunity. Drew Sanders did get an opportunity. Those guys weren't ready to actually play. When they got on the field, they were disappointing. So it's a bit weird to then say, well, you know, we didn't use them enough. No, you didn't coach them well enough to be used enough. So, you know what I mean? It's, it's yes, you didn't use them enough. That's true. But what are the reasons why you didn't use them enough? Because there was a push uh, week six, seven, eight around there where they made a clear decision to start playing Jaleel McLaughlin, Marvin Mims, Drew yeah. Sanders got in the field. There was clear there was a, a youth movement. And then it went away because those guys weren't ready for the moment. Yeah, I think for Sean Payton, um, he's knocking the rust off, right? He he had a year off uh, out, out of the game in the media doing his thing. Um and then he comes to a new team. He joins a new team, and everyone's a new player to him. And in a way, these are all rookies to him, right? And so he's got to figure out who he can count on in this first year, and most of them are veterans. And I think as he gets a lay of the land and becomes more familiar with his team, who he can trust, who the veterans are, then he'll have a better understanding on how to you know, uh, work with the rookies and get them involved and just kind of create the sort of – template that you would typically see year after year after year i think last year sean payton's first year back uh got to give him a mulligan a little bit on some of that stuff i mean he's got to get some new glasses he couldn't even see the playbook or you know the plays on the sideline like there's there's things that you know that he was a little rusty with and that he's going to get better at too so it's not just the players around it's not just it, it's not just finding the right guys it's 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 coming together as a unit and the and the coach's familiarity with those players matter and i think sean payton will be better in year two I love how we all, uh, you in particular, Nate, remember some little details about things like the uh, I called the wrong play because I couldn't read it. That was embarrassing. That that admission from Sean Payton. Listen, man, I will never, ever forget. I was death gripping the steering wheel, doing circles in the Cherry Creek Mall parking lot, going to the sushi restaurant after a win over the Packers. Yeah. Why can't I be happy? Why can't I be happy? <laughs> Well, because he wants to be the best, man, and that's good. That's a fire that yes, we want to burn yes, in our head coach. And, and ultim ultimately, you know, he wants to feel the chill of that trophy again. Oh, dude. Is the trophy really chilled? Is it? Well, no, you guys wouldn't know. All right. Um, <laughs> <that's>, uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> Love you guys. Kill oh. Hey, I got to kill you in truth. Oh. I got to kill Chuckle you in truth. Chuckle at my pain. Chuckle oh. at my pain. Oh.